It's very good to be here with you this weekend. When I talk about jihad and uh, the current war on Islamic fascism, um, I have a slightly uh, dual role, I find, which is that in Europe I preach uh, and talk pessimism, and in America I preach and talk optimism. And um, there's a reason for that, uh, which is that it seems to me that the big thing that needs to happen at the moment is that Europeans wake up, but that Americans don't give up on Europe. I say that because um, Mark Stein, for instance, has just written a wonderful book, I'm sure many of you have read it, America Alone, which seems again to suggest that Europe is simply gone as a continent, that it's over that it's so over over there. Um, Bat Yor, of course, um, a great scholar and a, a great writer, uh, came up with this term, Eurabia, which has now gained currency in America, which is, I think, very worrying. People too routinely talk about Eurabia. It is still Europe. And if you start calling it Eurabia, if you believe that this is the case, I do worry that you're going to give up on us. I do worry you're going to give up on the good people of Europe who are still there. So please, avoid that temptation and avoid the schadenfreude of thinking they've mucked up again, we're not going to help, we need you now. Um, the situation in Holland is um, desperately worrying. There's no doubt about that. Demographics, for one, are against us. Um, more than half of the children in Amsterdam schools are non-Dutch at the moment. Rotterdam is about to have a Muslim majority. The four largest cities in the Netherlands are predicted to have Muslim majorities in the next decade. The Dutch government in 2004 released a survey which said that by 2017, the majority of people in Holland will be non-Dutch. As Gerd Wilders said, an MP in the Dutch parliament, we will lose our country, it's as simple as that. And when people say, uh, why should we bother? Why should we care about this? It's only Holland or something like this. I would suggest this. Many people, particularly conservatives, like to come up with the phrase, well, at least it won't happen in my lifetime. This will happen in our lifetimes. This isn't a distant future. Eleven years, ladies and gentlemen, eleven years till you lose the Netherlands. Um, two people who did wake up to this early were Pim Fortuyn and Ther van Gogh, and of course both of them are now dead. Um, there are two speeches by both these men which haunt me really, apart from anything else, because they provided a kind of um, very saddening prophecy of both of their demise. Uh, Pim Fortuyn gave a speech just a few months before his death when he left something called the Liberal Netherlands Party and founded his own party, which in four months um, got a, a, a sweeping victory in the elections without then it was their leader who was killed shortly before the election. Uh, Pim said when he left the Liefbaum Netherlands party, uh, he gave a speech in which he said to his party, he said, I've kept my cool until now, but I won't hold it any longer. He said, it is five minutes to 12. It is five minutes to 12, not just in the Netherlands, but in all of Europe. That clock is still ticking, but without anything being done, it's just a little closer to midnight. When Ter van Gogh, uh, was still alive. Just shortly before his death, he made a, uh, a speech, a characteristic speech of Van Gogh, in which he uh, appeared in Amsterdam dressed as an imam, and uh, he uh, had a strap-on false beard. Uh, it was a sort of typically Van Gogh appearance, extremely tasteless but very funny as well, in which, among other things, he said that his so-called conversion to Islam uh, benefited him in two ways. He said, first of all, he found a religion uh, in which uh, women knew their place. <laughs> And secondly, he'd found some clothes that fitted. Um, but Van Gogh finished that speech in 2004, shortly before his death, saying, he said, Allah is the scourge which will conquer Amsterdam. Sleep well, good Amsterdamers. The truth is that in the two years to the month since Van Gogh was slaughtered on the streets of Amsterdam, the Dutch people and the Amsterdamers have indeed gone back to sleep. Largely a political problem, largely the fact that the right in Holland has split uh, without a leader since Fortuyn's death. They don't know who to back, where to go, turnout's been dropping, and uh, the parties that do exist, such as Wilders' party, have split and find no coherent voice.
At the moment, as you also know, there, is a, there are a set of private tragedies going on from Holland. Ayan Hersjali, you'll know of, of course, no longer lives in Holland. One of the immigrants that Holland needed most left. Uh, Ayan Hersjali, of course, now living in Washington. Um, Geert Wilders, her fellow MP, uh, lives under constant armed guard. Um, when he drives out, two motorcades go out, one decoy. Uh, wherever he drives, uh, he can't campaign. Has an election in Holland this week. His, two of his supporters only two weeks ago were beaten up by Moroccans in Amsterdam putting up posters. The process of democracy, in other words, is becoming exceedingly dangerous. Young Dutch supporters of Wilders will not stand for his party. Not because they don't support him, and not because they don't have guts, but because they will have to have security protection for the rest of their lives if they stand as a candidate. That's a large amount to ask of a young man or woman starting out in a political career. Um, a friend of mine, Bachan Splat, a, um, a head of the only conservative think tank in Holland, the Burke uh, Institute, uh, it's a wonderful organization set up a few years ago, was told shortly before Van Gogh's death by the, the police in Holland that he should take uh, protection. Uh, he said, well, if I need protection, why will you not protect me? And he said, well, they said, well, there isn't enough money. Uh, but they suggested he paid for it himself at the cost of 100 euros an hour, which, as you'll know, there's not that kind of money in think tanks. Um, so he went without protection until an hour after Van Gogh's death when the police were at his house and uh, whisked him away and gave him protection since. Afshin Elian, a great friend of mine, one of the great philosophers, I think, of Europe now, um, fled the Ayatollah Khomeini as a young man, fled to Afghanistan, where he then fled the Taliban and landed up in Holland where he currently teaches at the University of Leiden, teaches law and philosophy and he lives now under death sentence in Holland. Um, having fled theofascism all his life, he's now encountered its worst form in Holland where security guards sit on campus with him, the campus is searched for bombs every morning, um, Again, this is no life, and all that he has done is write newspaper columns fortnightly for the main conservative newspaper. Um, there are people who have stopped because they are so scared of what's going to happen. I know of journalists and others who simply stopped talking about uh, Islam. In one case, he went on television to read out his last newspaper column and said, leave me alone. I won't talk about Islam. I'll just continue teaching. Don't, don't hurt me. This is spreading across Europe which is why it's important to tackle it now there. In Denmark, only a couple of weeks ago, we all have heard of the cartoons catastrophe, and incidentally, those people who tell you that, uh, and you hear them a lot, that there was something provocative about that. We should do the thought test. What could you do if you wanted to make a criticism of something that would be smaller than drawing a cartoon? Those people who say that we should have no truck with. But in Holland and Denmark, cartoons at the moment matter. Two weeks ago, a, Dutch, a group of Dutch school, uh, sorry, of Danish school kids went on a kind of s scout camp thing and demonstrating that humor isn't dead among the young of Denmark uh, had their own mini cartoon competition. Uh, footage of this, filmed by someone, seems to be an infiltrator from another uh, political organization, filmed this and passed it to one of the main imams in Denmark who's just condemned by fatwa these young boys to death. Um, some of us are currently working at a fund to try to protect them, and I'd very gladly pass on details if you're interested afterwards. Um, in Belgium, one of the MPs, Mouat Boussacle, lives uh, under death sentence, lives under protection. The AEL, which was mentioned just now in 2002, had effectively a Kristallnacht imitation pogrom in, uh, in Antwerp, uh, in which the head of the AEL, the uh, thug and Hezbollah trainee Daya Abu Jaja, led chants in support of Osama bin Laden, the smashing up of Jewish stone shops, and then culminating in the chant, Hamas, Hamas, Allah, Yodan, Al Het Gas. Hamas, Hamas, all Jews to the gas. If we don't recognize these echoes now, I don't know when we will. In France, just a few weeks ago, as you'll know, Redica, a school teacher, um, has had to go into hiding after writing an article critical of Islam. Last two weeks ago, a German MP who spoke out, a Turkish immigrant MP who spoke out against the veil, was given death threats and now lives uh, under armed guard and in secure accommodation. 
The truth is this is simply spreading. It's even the case sometimes in the UK. I um, was invited by the uh, left-leaning newspaper, The Guardian, to write an article the other week explaining why I still support the Iraq war, uh, the bafflement and amazement they feel that uh, needs them to commission such articles was evident. And um, in response just to that, among other things, there were um, suggestions posted up on the Guardian website that I should be beheaded. Um, and uh, one post said that I should be beheaded because only if I was beheaded would there be peace. I think it's a new movement, pacifists for beheading. Um, but uh, I showed a I showed submission, the Iron Hersey Ali Van Gogh film in public for the first time to a group of MPs, peers, and others a couple of weeks ago and had armed guards for that. So sadly it's spreading, but there's no reason why we should step down or why we should be quieter, why we should stop. Um, the mosque, which Melanie just mentioned, the Tabliki Mosque, the Tabliki have a metaphor for how they're going to spread. They say that they put out the tentacles into Europe. They will put out the leads of all these light bulbs across Europe. All the strands will go out, and then Allah will turn on the lights. I suggest to you that if that light and those lights start to come on, the light of Europe will go out. But Europe is reawakening, and this is why I say do not be pessimists, do not sign up for Schadenfreude, and do not abandon this. Um, there are many movements in Europe at the moment, political and literary, to stop this. Just in the last few months, there's a new magazine started up in, in France, a superb magazine countering this, called um, Le Demain du Monde. Uh, do get it. Uh, Pinio, a new Dutch magazine, starting up next month in Holland. Um, there's a new publishing house in Italy, new newspapers in Italy. Across Europe, there is, a, there is a strong and I hope more and more connected movement of MPs, representatives, journalists and others who are standing up to this threat. And they are saying without any compunction and bravely, I think, in many of their cases, if you want Sharia law, you can go and have it, but it will not be here. It will not be in our lands. We have to be better at giving out that message, and I hope that you Americans will continue to support us as we say these things. Um, the UK, my own country, um, has uh, in recent years, as you know, stood absolutely shoulder to shoulder with your country, and our troops fight daily beside yours in Afghanistan and Iraq, and uh, the British government and many of the British people are very proud of that. And it reminds me of uh, I'll finish here, but it reminds me of one of my favorite stories, really, of one of the greatest men, Winston Churchill, who in 1940, when Britain was still standing alone against the threat of fascism last time, uh, Churchill invited the American ambassador to St. the court of St. James uh, to discuss your country um, providing provisions to uh, Britain in our darkest hour. And Winston Churchill, over a whole course of a weekend, persuaded your ambassador um, that he should uh, give provision, military and so on, to Britain. And at the end of the weekend, uh, when the ambassador was flying back to see the president that night, and he said, um, he said to Churchill, I wonder if you'd be interested in knowing what I'm going to say to the president. And Churchill agreed that he would like to know. And uh, the ambassador simply quoted from the second book of Ruth, uh, the first book of Ruth, the second chapter, I'm sorry, and just said to Winston Churchill then, he said, this is what I'm going to say. He said, whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I shall lodge also, and thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. And then he said, added, even to the end. You kept that pact then. We have kept it in the last five years, and I hope you'll find it to continue keeping that pact in the years ahead. Thank you.